Hello everyone, I'm Karl Zielinski and some people have been asking me to talk a bit about parametric polymorphism. Parametric polymorphism is essentially Odin's system for creating, for generating generic procedures, generic structs and some other stuff that we will also see in this uh, video. And it's sort of more than just polymorphism really, because if you look up polymorphism, like a definition of it, it might be something like uh, for a certain symbol, being able to uh, have that symbol represent several different types in some other languages, that, that could be a definition. But we'll see that in Odin it is actually slightly more than that. And I will just go through a couple of examples here. What you should pay attention to is is where the dollar sign is, is what I say. And what I mean by this is whenever we use parametric polymorphism, there will appear a dollar sign in the code. And pay attention to, is that one uh, on a proc parameter type or is it on a proc parameter name or is it somewhere else? That's sort of important because uh, when you initially look at this, it, uh, it can be a bit, uh, it, it's easy to get a bit confused or, or mix it up. Okay, so let's go to the first example here, which I call for a procedure, make it so that a parameter is generic, so that you can send any a parameter of any value into that procedure. So here I have a procedure called clamp. There is a clamp procedure shipped with Odin, but this is just for the sake of the example. And this clamp takes a value, a minimum value and a maximum value, uh, and they're all of type F32, and it returns something of type F32. And this is currently not generic at all, but what it does, it just checks if val is less than min, then it returns min, if it's more than max, then it returns max, otherwise it returns the value. So it sort of puts value in the range between min and max. This is hard coded to F32, so if we do something like this, where we have a variable number that is of type F32, then we can run the procedure with it and it all works fine. If we have a another variable called number two that is of type integer and we try to use this procedure then it won't work because it expects these parameters to be of type f32 and this is integer so that won't work. So we let's just now make this one generic and that's actually very simple to do. So here's the same procedure. The only thing I've changed is that I've replaced the f32 here with a dollar sign t, there's a dollar sign. And I have also changed the return value to just t, no dollar sign there, but just that's the only two changes I made. And now something like this where I where I send in a, an integer to it to, to clamp it in the range between five, five and seven, that would work. I could also send an f64 and f32, all of it would work. And what happens here is actually that the compiler, when, when it is compiling the program and sees this function call, it will generate uh, different versions of clamp based on the parameter. So it will look at the parameter you send in here. Okay, it's an integer. And then it will generate a version of clamp that has type integer here. And then it will also use the type integer here. So it generates the different variants for you. Since it generates it, whatever the body of the procedure is, like whatever code is in here, must be possible to express with that type. So if you send in something to this generic procedure that, for example, does not define this less than or equals operator, then you will get the compilation error because the compiler failed to generate the code for you, right? Now, this dollar sign here is on the parameter type in this case. For example, I couldn't take the dollar sign from here and put it here. That would not work because there's nothing sort of in this body of this procedure that makes it so that it could figure that out. It, it has it here because from the parameter that is sent in here, val, it can uh, see that, okay, it's an integer, so we put integer here and then we can reuse the same type here. So let's look at another example that might look slightly different, but uh, is related and we shall see how it all connects a bit later. So here we have an example where, that I call force proc parameters to be compile time constants. 
So we have a very silly procedure here called make array of seven. This is not useful for anything except as an example. This one makes an array called res and it is a fixed array of f32. And then it goes through the whole array and sets each element to seven and then returns it. The length of this fixed array, since it's a fixed array, the length of it must be known at compile time. The length is n. n comes from this thing here. And you notice here that we have this dollar sign here again. But if you compare this one to the one up here, here the dollar sign is on the type. Here the dollar sign is on the name of the parameter. What this is saying is that we want this parameter to be a compile time constant. In fact, when the dollar sign is there, we can use whatever value n has as a compile time constant because it, 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 whatever value we feed into this procedure must be a compile time constant outside the procedure and then we can use it as a compile time constant within the procedure as well because a fixed size array its size must be known at compile time. You, you can create dynamic arrays and uh, you know dynamically allocate slices and all that but a fixed size array must be known, the size of it must, must be known at compile time. So whatever goes between these brackets must be a compile time constant. So to use this procedure, you say, oh, okay, we make an array and it is we want it to be 20 long. So then it, you can sort of think of it as if this parameter didn't even exist and it was just 20 there and 20 there. Like when that, that's that version. And if you, if you made another version, 25, then you would have another version of it that has 25 here, etc. It's sort of like you can almost think of it as sort of copy pasting that in there for you since it's sort of like a compile time constant. Let's look at something that will not work in this case. Uh, for example, here we have, we say array two is make array of seven. And then we say, give me number. We call a procedure that returned 24. This is not a compile time constant. I mean, this procedure could return anything. Uh, it's not known at compile time what it uh, what this procedure might or might not do. In this case, it might look almost like you could figure it out, but this is just a very simple example. So in this case, this would be a compile error because it, this is the, the return value of a procedure is not a compile time constant. Let's look at the next example, which is also a compile time constant. And soon we will sort of we look at the next example and then we look back at uh, the first one, like, you know, with clamp, we had a, a, a parameter of a generic type. So we look at one more compile time constant and then we will sort of compare the two a bit and see the similarities or so. So in this case, we have a procedure called make random sized slice. Again, very silly procedure, not useful for anything really, but it takes a compile time constant because the dollar sign is on the name of the parameter and the type of it is type ID. Type ID is the type of types. So uh, since T is type ID, you can also use it here as sort of the return value type. And what this procedure does is it, it generates a random value between zero and 1024, 1024, and then it dynamically allocates a slice. But that's not the important thing here. The important thing is the T here. Right. So if we look at, if we look at how we use this, we say my slice is my slice is whatever thing this returns. So we say make random size slice, and then we just say a type name here. You say F32. So then T here will be the type F32. That's why we can use it here and we can send it into make make also here expects compile time constant type ID. So we can see sort of that. Up here we had sort of an integer compile time constant and here we have a type ID compile time constant. But if we now think back a bit to the example we had up with clamp where we had a parameter of any type instead of just a compile time constant. So we have something like this down here. Here we have make random size slice with value. And here you see I have a parameter that has a value and the type of it is T. So this is a parameter of any type and it also brings along a value. And it does the exact same thing. It makes a slice of random size and then it goes loops over the whole slice and sets each 
value in it to V and then returns it. You see how we use it here. My slice is make random size slice with value 7.42. What you can notice here is that in this case, we could use T as on the return value here, but on this case, T was over here on the side and here it's on the, on the type side instead. And we have a value of the type T as well. But in fact, in both these cases, in this case, T is a type ID. In this case, T is a type ID. But in this case, we also have a value associated. In this case, we also have a value of that type. So you can think of it like if you have a procedure where you only need to reason about a type, because maybe you want to make some kind of array or something of that type, then you can put in a compile time constant that is a type ID because probably you don't even have, you don't have a value to, to give it. But if you want to do something like this, where we create an array and populate it with some stuff, then you can do like this instead and, and both give a value and get the type at the same time. But what I hope to sort of illustrate here is that just typing like this is sort of like typing this plus a value as well. So we can go ahead and look a bit also at generic structs now. Uh, so I said that we can generate generic uh, procedures <clears throat> and then generic structs as well. Generic structs is, so if you look at this, this is from the uh, small array in, uh, in the core uh, collection. So when you declare structs, you can use compile time constants as well. In this case, we have n, is a compile time constant that is an integer. There is also a T, which is a compile time constant that is of type type ID. And this struct has a field data that is an fixed size array of N items of type T. So then we can create, this is actually slightly wrong like that. So then we can create a variable uh, SA that is a small array. It's 128 F32s inside. And then we can create SA2, which is also of type S, a small array, that is 20 of some struct types, just some, some struct you have in your program. So whenever you run this one and this one, again, the compiler is generating the different variations of this struct for you. You, you can sort of think of it as the value you put in here being sort of just pasted in and it generates the different variations for you. You may also notice that we have sort of a extra condition on the side here. It says that n must be equal or bigger to zero. So you can put this weird thing here and then save things about these uh, compile time constants here. Uh, and the thing you compare to must of course also be a compile time constant. So we will look a tiny bit more of that soon. Now let's look at speci specializations, which is can be quite interesting. So some of these examples are from the core or base collections that come with the compiler. And the first one here is delete dynamic array. And we see that delete dynamic array is a procedure and we can ignore these other things here. Just look at this one here. So array here, it's a parameter and the type, it, it can be of any type, dollar sign T, but there's a slash after it. And then it says dynamic dollar sign E. This stuff, like the way you define a, a dynamic array in Odin is like, is something like this, right? So what this is saying is that the slash is for specialization. So it means that this can be any type, given that it uh, is a dynamic array where each value uh, where the type of each value can be any other type. So we, we can, within this, the body of this procedure now, use both T and E, where T is the, the type of the whole uh, dynamic array. We, we're not using that anywhere, but uh, E is the type of the each element in dynamic array. So if, like I said, I had here, in this case, uh, if I used uh, this procedure with with this uh, dynamic array, then uh, E here would be int. So that's how you specialize it. So you, just anything after the slash sort of sets constraints on this generic type. 
and uh, yeah, then we have another example also from the same file uh, that is pop. It just removes the last element of a dynamic array. The only difference here I want to point out is that if you want a pointer, then you just add the pointer thingy here and then type it as usual. So it's a pointer to something that is of this sort of generic type. And then we can go down to this example here, make slice. And th this one gets quite interesting because you can have the dollar sign on both the name saying that this is a compile time, the, 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 the value must be a compile time constant. And then you can have the dollar sign on the other side as well to say that, to say things about the type. But it, it, it's quite interesting to see because um, like in this case here, you have with the di delete dynamic array, you have a totally generic type here, and then you can specialize on that. But when you have a type ID, you can also specialize it. Like if you, if it was int here, this wouldn't really mean anything because how can you specialize in? But when it says type ID on this side, you can actually specialize the type ID itself like this. Another thing about specialization that I can mention here is that we have this, we have this clamp example from before, and we saw this weird thing quickly. And this is not really specialization from the parametric polymorphism in that sense, but it's more, sometimes you need to set limitations on what type you want it to be able to feed into this procedure. And then you can say where, and then you can say intrinsics.type is numeric T, for example, and then this thing here must then be numeric. And there's a bunch of different procedures in this intrinsics um, package. What's special about them is that they are intrinsic to the compiler, so the thing you send in here should be a compile time constant, but what it returns is also a compile time constant. So these are actually, these can, these are sort of special procedures that can be used at compile time to, to, to set these kind of limitations. You couldn't use any old procedure here. It must be a procedure that is intrinsic to the compiler. And then finally, and we saw this a bit above, but you can have a compile time constant of any type. And I have never done this uh, uh, like in this generic way, but you could have a procedure that takes a parameter where the parameter must be a compile time constant and the type is generic. You could do that up. Up here, we almost did that. We have a compile time constant here but we say that it is a type ID, but we specialize it so that it um, must be a slice of some generic elements. But I've, I, I haven't ever really used this, but it's just good to know, to see what the limitations are. So we have seen the, the dollar sign a bit everywhere. In a sense, anything that is sort of has the dollar sign in front is a compile time constant. Because if you think of it, if you go back to the earliest example here, um, here, the, this is, sure, this is a generic type, but all these, all different types are compile time constants. And then we had these other examples where we said that we want a compile time constant that is an integer. So in all these different cases, we are actually dealing with compile time constant. So, so the dollar sign says just part of it says that it should be a compile time constant, but the location of it, if it's to the right of here, then, then it means, okay, the, we can sort of take any type here and we sort of give it a name T and over here we just have a parameter, but we promise that it is a compile time constant so that we can use it as that within this procedure. Now connecting back to the name parametric polymorphism. I think the, the fact that it sort of both does sort of this kind of, that it both lets you pass uh, values of any type in this way, and that it makes it possible to, to enforce that things are compiled and constant, that, the, that those two things both fall under the name parametric polymorphism, I think some people find confusing. But what you can think of instead, and this is from uh, later in my Discord server said something like this, I'm paraphrasing, but that when you have a procedure with dollar signs here and there, it's sort of like a template where, where, where you can generate 
procedures based on the unique combination of all those dollar signs within that procedure. That was it. Thank you all for watching and I will see you around. Thank you. Bye.